Good day, everyone. For Telesur, I'm Cody Weddle in Caracas, Venezuela. Venezuela's Congress, the National Assembly, has passed the legislation that will give President Nicolas Maduro the right to enact executive orders. It's a move designed to defend the country from continual U.S. aggression. The measure was approved by 60% of the legislative body and will be put to a second round of discussions before final approval. Now, according to President Maduro, the executive orders that will be facilitated by the law will be enacted in order to defend Venezuela's sovereignty and maintain peace in the face of U.S.-led destabilization attempts. The move comes after Washington declared Venezuela a security threat on Monday. Every time the United States has made such declarations, they have invaded militarily. It happened in Nicaragua in 1985. It happened in Panama in 1990. In Iraq. In Afghanistan. In Libya. Every time that they have made these declarations, they have activated their armed forces. They're always looking for a justification to set up the detonator. Member states of the Union of South American Nations have expressed their outrage over Washington, Washington's decision to classify Venezuela as a threat to the U.S. people. According to Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa, a meeting of the UNICER bloc is being scheduled to discuss any matter and any possible responses. On Thursday in Montevideo, Uruguay, the foreign ministers of UNISUR will meet to prepare a summit of heads of state for the following week. We are going to provide an answer for this grotesque, illegal, shameless, and unjustified interference of the United States in the internal affairs of Venezuela. Opposition to the United States' interference in Venezuela has spread around the world. As our correspondent Allison Kentish reports, in the Caribbean, St. Lucian nationals are speaking out against the escalation in aggressions from Washington. Political scientist Dennis Springer describes the United States sanctions against Venezuela as atrocious. He says he was shocked and dismayed to learn of the disturbing developments. To target Venezuela in that way, I believe the whole of, of the Caribbean should stand in, in unity with Venezuela and say to the Americans, if you, if you target them, then you target all of us. Because this is, this is uh, the South American coast, so to speak. We are part and parcel of the Caribbean that joins up with them. They are helping us. They have their own country to look after and they're making it their duty to help others with Petrocarib and and look the, the computers that, that our school children have now got. You know, all these sorts of things. You know, I think the rest of the Caribbean should say to the Americans, enough is enough and Venezuela has not interfered with you. Social activist Edgar Rossini Frasois has long been a supporter of the Bolivarian Revolution. He too questions the motives of the U.S. government. Well, considering since 2008 the pronouncements of Obama, it doesn't surprise me, but at the same time, considering the, the complexities of the situation he's now found himself in, um, to create enemies south of the border makes absolutely no sense. It is true that they have lost control over Latin America, not only because of the Bolivarian Revolution, mainly because of the behavior of the United States in Central and South America, and to a certain degree in the Caribbean. Representatives of the Venezuelan government in St. Lucia have planned a press conference for Friday, at which time they will issue a formal statement on the matter. In St. Lucia, the question is why. Why would the United States of America be taking this hardline decision against Venezuela at this time? Alison Kentish, Telesur, Cash Street, St. Lucia. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos has ordered a temporary halt to airstrikes against the camps of the FARC guerrilla movement. Santos is also setting up an, a peace advisory commission. It comes as talks to end the armed conflict in Colombia enter a decisive phase. 
The advisory commission will include figures from across the political spectrum. Those include former presidential candidates Antanas Mocas, Clara Lopez, and Marta Lucia Ramirez, as well as the uh, former president Andres Pastrana. The suspension of bombardments against the FARC will last initially for one month. I have decided to order the Ministry of Defense and commanders of the armed forces to stop bombings over FARC camps for a month. After that time, we will again review the implementation of the FARC's unilateral ceasefire. And on the basis of that, we will decide whether to continue with this measure. In any case, we will not give up the right to bomb if we see that any community is under threat. This week, we learned that both sides in the Colombian conflict agreed to begin a process of demining the country. It's a life-changing decision for Colombians who have lived with the threat of landmines now for decades. The victims of anti-personnel mines are mostly campesinos working their land and their children. Many hope the agreement to clear more than 100,000 mines will allow them to return to their farms and spare future generations. They should get rid of all these damn mines because they destroy the lives of anyone who passes, whether civilian or military. If they remove the mines, people will be able to go back and cultivate their plots and have a future, and their children will be able to have a future too and not suffer the same fate as we did. For more now on these developments in Colombia, we turn to our correspondent there, Natalia Margarita. On a nationwide televised address on Tuesday night, President Juan Manuel Santos announced he has ordered the suspension of air strikes on FARC rebels for one month. President Santos said he has made this decision in virtue of the progress in the peace negotiations between the Colombian government and the FARC that are underway in Havana since 2012, but also in response to the successful bilateral ceasefire that the FARC has been implementing since the 20th of December last year. So this latest decision is, on the one hand, the first concrete reply from the government to the FARC unilateral ceasefire, but also, on the other hand, the biggest steps the government has taken towards the end of hostilities and the de-escalation of the conflict. As the ban on, aer on aerial raids will initially last one month, the president said it might very well be extended if the FARC continues to comply with the ceasefire. And this is of enormous significance as the FARC has been continuously showing their engagement to the ceasefire, and this is something that has already been a knowledge, not just by the people living in the rural areas of Colombia, but also by national institutions as well as international organisms. So here we're talking about a very, very high probability of finally reaching a definitive de-escalation of the conflict, given by the cessation of hostilities between the FARC and the Colombian army. Not to forget that these two armed actors have also just agreed on a joint operation to start clearing landmines, something that here in Colombia has been labeled as historic, as it is the first time that the army and the fire join efforts to create conditions for peace. This is the latest information from Bogotá, Natalia Margarita, Telesur. Public auditors in Brazil are opening an investigation into 10 large companies allegedly linked to corruption in the state-controlled oil giant Petrobras. The move comes as opposition parties seek to open proceedings against President Dilma Rousseff in connection with the Petrobras case. Rousseff assures that while the country may be passing through a difficult time, there is no crisis and that her economic reform measures are geared towards balancing public accounts. The Mexican legislature has approved the nomination of an alleged human rights violator to the nation's Supreme Court. Our correspondent Clayton Kahn now with this update. Late on Tuesday, Mexico's Senate approved by 83 votes in favor, acquiring the two-thirds necessary to approve the nomination of Eduardo Medina Mora as the country's new Supreme Court Justice. Now, the former Attorney General, Ambassador to the United States and England, as well as Mexico's former spy agency chief, was voted in under a storm of criticism by opposition members and civil society organizations who point to possible human rights and constitutional rights violations while he was Attorney General. Just prior to the debate and vote in the Senate, more than 52,000 signatures gathered by Change.org 
Senator.org against the approval were delivered to senators. However, the show of citizen rejection did not stop the vote in his favor. Mr. Mora, who was chosen by President Enrique Peña Nieto to fill the vacant Supreme Court seat, has been accused of orchestrating violent police operations against mass protests in 2006, as well as being behind the launch of the so-called drug war strategy that has in less than a decade left potentially up to 100,000 people dead, according to rights organizations. His tenure as Supreme Court justice will last 15 years. This is Clayton Kahn reporting for Telesur here in Mexico City. In the United States now, Ferguson, Missouri City Manager John Shaw has been removed from his job. It comes in response to a damning Justice Department report on the Ferguson Police Department. His removal from office follows a series of resignations in the city in the past two weeks. Two police officers, a municipal judge, and a court clerk stepped down after the report revealed systemic racism in the Ferguson Department. The report was issued following the shooting death of unarmed black teenager Michael Brown by a white police officer in August. Terrible, terrible issue. And I do thank you and many And staying in the U.S., an Army helicopter has crashed, leaving seven Marines and four soldiers dead off the coast of Florida. The crash came as the military was conducting a routine night training exercise. The Coast Guard has found debris of the helicopter. And uh, we have some. Sweden's Supreme Court has issued an appeal hearing to WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Assange's lawyers have been trying to appeal sexual assault charges he faced. They were used by Swedish authorities to issue an arrest warrant in absentia. Assange says that if he returned to Sweden, he would be extradited to the U.S., where the FBI continues a criminal investigation into WikiLeaks. Iraqi security forces and Shiite militias seize large parts of Tikrit from the Islamic State. Islamic State militants have begun retreating, according to multiple reports. The progress has come after a week of heavy fighting in the towns near the city of Tikrit. It marks the largest Iraqi operation yet and involves more than 30,000 fighters. If it succeeds, it would be a significant uh, move for the Iraqi government in its attempts to regain the Anbar province. And in Europe, in London, archaeologists are digging up thousands of centuries-old skeletons, including those of plague victims. The excavations are taking place in a location that will become a new train station. The construction site happens to be on the top of the city's first burial ground, which was used between 1569 and 1738. It was used by Londoners who could not afford a church burial. The excavation is also expected to uncover the remains of an ancient Roman road. British singer Sarah Brightman is working with her ex-husband and composer Andrew Lloyd Webber to perform inside an international space station. Brightman is famous for her performances in Cats and Phantom of the Opera. She will become the first artist to perform in orbit. The world-famous soprano will spend 10 days in space, taking off on September 1st from a base in Kazakhstan. She will be the eighth tourist sent to space by the U.S. company Space Adventures. Plenty more on those stories and others at our website, telesurtv.net slash English for Telesur English. I'm Cody Weddle. Have a great day.